Today, the Matt Wall Show, armed gangs of illegal immigrants are descending on the country as we plunge further into crime and chaos due to our uncontrolled border. Also, Kamala Harris finally emerges from hiding to do her first interview since becoming the nominee, and it does not go well. And Trump is being relentlessly attacked for an alleged photo op at Arlington National Cemetery. Is this just the latest anti-Trump hoax? Of course it is. We'll talk about all that and more today on the Matt Wall Show. Get 40% off new annual Daily Wire Plus memberships during our Labor Day sale. Go to dailywire.com slash subscribe and use code LABOR40 at checkout. Unlock on-demand access to our uncensored daily shows, groundbreaking documentaries, live news, and in-depth election coverage. Join us as we fight the left and build the future. Five years ago, a 47-year-old man from Senegal hijacked a school bus full of children uh, just outside Milan, the business capital of Italy, he ordered the teachers and a janitor to restrain all the children with zip ties, and his motive was clear. The man threatened to carry out a massacre to avenge all of the illegal migrants who drowned on their way to Europe. Essentially, he wanted open borders, and he was threatening to commit mass murder to get it. And he seemed intent on making good on that promise. During a 40-minute rampage, the man rammed the school bus into several cars on the highway before lighting the bus on fire. Now, at that point, the 51 children on board managed to escape, thanks in part to the adults who didn't actually secure the zip ties on any of the students. But this 2019 school bus hijacking changed the trajectory of Italy's politics overnight, and you can see why. People will buy into a lot of very bad policies in the name of tolerance and acceptance and all of that nonsense. But when a guy from Senegal hijacks a school bus full of children and tries to light them on fire, it's pretty clear that a red line has been crossed. That's an unmistakable sign that things need to change, and voters in Italy responded accordingly. It's one of the reasons that uh, Maloney was elected prime minister in 2022 on a platform calling for a naval blockade to keep illegal migrants out of the country. Now, on Wednesday, this country here in the United States came very close to experiencing a similar incident in the state of California, which long ago adopted European-style migration policies. On two separate occasions, groups of illegal migrants attempted to board a school bus on the highway near the Mexican border in the Jamal uh, Dozora Union School District. In the first instance, three men stood in the middle of the highway, apparently attempting to uh, force the school bus to stop. In the second instance, a group of about 20 illegal migrants were waiting on another route for another bus. It's not clear if the same illegal aliens were involved in both of these incidents, but uh, this is what happened. Watch. A group of migrants tried to board a school bus this morning while it was traveling to a school. The superintendent for the Humboldt del Zura Union School District informed parents of that incident earlier today. It happened at one of the stops on the school district's bus route that heads to Oak Grove Middle School and Humboldt Primary. Meanwhile, yesterday afternoon in a similar area along another route, the superintendent says that a group of migrants tried to stop another bus. Border Patrol, CHP, and the Sheriff's Office have now been informed of these incidents. The superintendent says that for the safety of everyone, if a driver sees a group of migrants at a bus stop, they will drive past it on uh, and move on to the next. So the plan is apparently just like leave the kids at the bus stop next time uh, if they're there with migrants. What else can you possibly do? Surely you can't have the police round up and arrest this group of people who are in this country illegally terrorizing children and threatening to hijack buses. I mean, that would just be unthinkable, intolerant even. So instead, uh, the children can just fend for themselves. The school bus will get out of jo Dodge like the last chop chopper out of uh, Hanoi. Meanwhile, the sheriff's office in San Diego says that they're investigating to determine if a criminal act has occurred. So they're not quite sure if standing in the middle of the road in a country where you're not legally allowed to be, and threatening to hijack a school bus, he's not sure if those are really crimes. Maybe bus hijacking has been decriminalized also in California. They're, they're still uh, looking into it, I guess. Now, this is one of those moments where an abstract policy debate suddenly becomes a lot less abstract. I mean, it's one thing to talk about how no person is illegal and so on, but it's quite another to tolerate something like this. And there are very clear signs that Americans, like Italians, are tired of tolerating it. Very tired. 
Earlier this year, Axios reported on a poll showing that, quote, half of Americans, including 42% of Democrats, say they would support mass deportations of undocumented immigrants. Additionally, quote, two-thirds of Americans said illegal immigration is a real crisis, not a politically driven media narrative. So as more people see the unavoidable consequences of mass migration in their everyday lives, support for mass deportations is only going to increase even further. The reality of unrestricted illegal immigration is, is that everyday events suddenly become a lot more dangerous all over the place to the point that the, the policy itself becomes completely untenable. And that's why it's not just Californians who can't escape these consequences anymore. In Aurora, Colorado, an apartment complex has reportedly been taken over by Venezuelan street gangs. Uh, surveillance footage shows gunmen with rifles walking around the, uh, the apartment complex with impunity. There's trash everywhere. Residents report that a bunch of illegal aliens moved in recently, and, uh, and this is what's happening, and, and, and crime and shootings are now commonplace. Watch. So this is an apartment complex in the state of Colorado. It's, it's not actually in Venezuela, despite what it may appear to be the case. Now, several police departments in Colorado have responded to this footage. For their part, Aurora PD say that they are aware that components, quote unquote, of this Venezuelan gang known as TDA are operating in the area. The police department also says that it's been increasingly collecting evidence to show the gang is connected to crimes in the area, although they claim that these crimes are isolated, whatever that means. But here's the most incredible part of the statement. Listen to this. Quote, the city and Aurora Police Department, as previously stated, established a special task force in collaboration with other local, state, and federal partners to specifically address concerns about Venezuelan gang Tren de Ergua and other criminal activity affecting migrant communities. So they say that the, the gang is committing criminal activity affecting migrant communities. But obviously, it's not just affecting the migrant communities. It's affecting, more importantly, the millions of American citizens who pay taxes in Colorado. It's affecting American communities, people the Aurora Police Department are supposedly sworn to protect. But they don't even get a mention in the police department statement. Even when they're talking about the takeover of an apartment building by illegal aliens, the police are still primarily concerned with the illegal aliens. Meanwhile, Denver PD released its own statement. They actually do mention the residents of their community and not just the migrants. So that's something. They also denied that an apartment was taken over, despite the video evidence to the contrary. Uh, that assessment would also contradict the conclusion of Aurora's mayor, who just said on national television that multiple buildings have fallen to Venezuelan gangs. And it's also possible they were funded by the U.S. government. Watch of Aurora, Colorado. Mayor, thank you very much for, for coming on with us. Um, it seems it's tough Pleasure to even you. get some confirmation of the details of what is going on there. First off, um, can you confirm whether or not this gang has taken over these buildings there in Aurora? So there are several buildings uh, actually under the same ownership, out of state ownership, uh, that have uh, fallen to uh, these Venezuelan gangs. Uh, we're, I'm trying to walk it back and do the, and do the, the investigation as to how the Vene there's a concentration of Venezuelans uh, uh, in these these three buildings. Uh, um, somebody put them there and somebody funded it. Uh, whether it's federal government or not, we're trying to find out who. So this would seem like something that the Denver Police Department should know about. But to be fair, they admitted that the Venezuelan gang is committing a lot of crimes and they're, quote, uh, uh, learning about all of it. They're still, you know, they're looking into it. And there's a lot of that kind of learning going on right now in Colorado, one way or another. This week, for example, the residents of Colorado learned that illegal immigrants can uh, legally drive big rigs on the road and kill American citizens while driving recklessly and then get off with a maximum sentence of one year in prison. That's what's happening right now in the case of Ignacio Cruz Mendoza, an illegal alien without a valid commercial driver's license, who crashed his 18-wheeler into a car being driven by Scott Miller. Watch. 
hold these people accountable for their actions. After losing her husband less than three months ago, Deanne will walk into a courtroom on Friday to tell a judge why the man who crashed into her husband deserves the maximum sentence. A sentence she feels is far too short. Mad because the least, the most he, this man could get is a year for murdering my husband because the DA refused to to charge him with more charges. So how short is a one-year sentence? Earlier this year, a truck driver in Weld County was sentenced to 16 years for a deadly crash on I-25. A couple years back, the same district attorney's office in Jefferson County who prosecuted the truck driver who killed four people on I-70, that driver got a 110-year sentence before the governor stepped in to reduce it. Deanne still trying to wrap her mind around why more charges weren't filed before this driver had the opportunity to plead guilty. So it's obviously infuriating and outrageous, but um, I don't know, allegedly the Democrat DA's office just made an innocent little mistake here. Apparently it's their first day on the job. They didn't realize that by charging this illegal alien with misdemeanors and nothing else, that uh, he could then plead guilty to those misdemeanors and then double jeopardy kicks in and they can't charge him anymore. This was all supposedly totally unforeseeable to the DA. That's the excuse. Now, in order to believe that, you'd, you'd have to know nothing about the leadership of the state of Colorado, which goes out of its way to mock concerns about illegal, illegal alien crime. In response to the apartment takeover that I mentioned earlier, for example, the state's governor, Jared Polis, put out a snarky statement mocking Aurora City Councilwoman Danielle Jarinski, who initially complained about the incident. Polis's office said, quote, the purported invasion is largely a feature of Danielle Jarinski's imagination. Even though it's on tape, we can see it. And he also said that crime has been going down, et cetera, and so forth. This is the extent of the response that voters in left-wing states can expect when they object to the systematic destruction of their communities and their way of life. The more they complain about school bus hijackings and apartment takeovers and highway crashes, the more their leaders will just laugh at them. And there's precedence for this. It's what happened in Italy, among many other European nations. And if that precedent is any indication, it means that we are getting very close to the point at which people have had enough in this country. And when that point comes, none of these people will be in power anymore. They'll be replaced with leaders who, like Maloney, will promise to end unrestricted migration. And hopefully, unlike Maloney, the people we elect will actually fulfill that promise. Now let's get to our five headlines. Anybody with a basic understanding of economics can see that the economy is in pretty bad shape right now. I'm not saying the sky is falling, but would you jump out of a plane without a parachute? Probably not. Well, consider this your economic parachute warning. I've been telling you for years to diversify your portfolio with precious metals. If you haven't yet, now's the time. Birch Gold makes it easy to convert your IRA or 401k into a precious, precious metals IRA. It's a smart way to protect your hard-earned savings from the impending economic disaster. But hey, if protecting your financial future isn't motivation enough, how about this? Backed by popular demand, now through the end of the month, you can get your very own 24 karat gold-plated truth bomb on qualifying purchases. It's a little reminder of the truth bombs we here at Daily Wire deliver every day and the smart decisions you made to invest in gold. Here's what you need to do. Text Walsh to 989898. You'll get a free info kit and learn how you can own gold in a tax-sheltered IRA account. Let's all put our financial parachutes on before the economy takes a nosedive. Don't wait for the crash to hit. Text Walsh to 989898 now and claim your eligibility. Qualifying purchases made before August 31st can get a golden truth bomb to serve as a reminder of the great decision you made to protect your savings with gold. That's Walsh to 989898. So last night was the uh, big interview, the big day, the big moment on CNN. Kamala Harris finally emerged from, from hiding uh, with her emotional support dog, her golden retriever, Tim, Tim Walls. And they sat down for an interview. Uh, it's the first time she's answered any questions since wrestling the nomination away from uh, the cucumber, who is technically still president right now. And as expected, the interview did not go well. Um, it didn't go well, and it kind of proved why she hadn't done any interviews until that point. And, uh, and it also proves why, uh, st strategically, they should have just stayed the course and not done any interviews. I mean, she could have gotten away, probably gotten away, with not just not doing any interviews until the election. She could have gotten away with it. And, uh, and it was a tactical mistake to, um, to sit down for this interview because the moment she sits down and starts speaking off cuff, off the cuff, it's just, uh, this, this, the, the, the 
hype bubble that has been surrounding her for the last month is is punctured. Um, and that's what we saw. So uh, let's we'll start with this clip. This is the one that's probably gotten the most attention. And here she's asked by the anchor, Dana Bash, about all of the flip-flopping that she's done. And um, here is her excuse. How should voters look at some of the changes that you've made, uh, that you've explained some of here uh, in your policy? Is it because you have more experience now and you've learned more about the information? Is it because you were running for president in a Democratic primary? And should they feel comfortable and confident that what you're saying now is going to be your policy moving forward? Dan, I think the, the, the most important and most significant aspect of my policy perspective and decisions is my values have not changed. You mentioned the Green New Deal. I have always believed, and I have worked on it, that the climate crisis is real, that it is an urgent matter, to which we should apply metrics that include holding ourselves to deadlines around time. We did that with the Inflation Reduction Act. We have set goals for the United States of America and by extension the globe around when we should meet certain standards for reduction of greenhouse gas emissions as an example. That value has not changed. Okay, so let's review all the problems with this, uh, or at least some of the major ones. First of all, Dana Bash gives her the... uh, gives her the question with multiple choice answers. So she asks her about the flip-flopping and then feeds her a couple of possible answers that she might give. And one of them is, oh, is it, uh, is it just that you've learned more and, you're, and you're, so your policy, you know, as, as you've grown and learned, you've changed your opinion. Um, and that's, you know, that's about as good ex- an excuse for flip-flopping as you're going to get. And so Kamala Harris could have said, well, yes, yeah, it's exactly that. You're you're 100 right. That's it. Uh, listen, I've 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 learned. I've grown. I've uh, as I've gotten more information, I've changed. Just just like anyone, I've changed my view as I've gotten more information. Uh, she should, she could have said that, but but she doesn't. Instead, Kamala doesn't take the hint, does not accept the gift that's been given to her, and she goes off on a ramble about how her values haven't changed. She won't deny that her policies have changed. She says her values haven't. So, um, well, then then if your values haven't, then why why have your policies? Change. Are you admitting to being being an opportunist and a hypocrite? Uh, is it is it like isn't it better? It, it's one thing if your if your policies have changed in the same direction, right? Maybe you you were you were liberal and they become more liberal. Well, then you can say, well, my values haven't changed. But when the policies flip, when it's the opposite of what it was before, and yet your values are exactly the same. Well, all that tells us what you're admitting is that either before or now, you're full of it. You're, you're being an opportunist. You're being a hypocrite. Then she goes off on the climate crisis. She says, and, and I quote, I wrote this down. She says, it's an urgent matter to which we should apply metrics that include holding ourselves to deadlines around time. So this is more patented Kamala word salad. As always, she, she continues to speak like an eighth grader, you know, writing a book report and stretching to hit the word limit. You know, it's, it's, you got to get to two pages and, and you're at uh, one and two thirds of a page. And so you just got to keep, it's too late to go back and use a bigger font or whatever. So, um, so uh, deadlines around time, she says. Well, these are deadlines around, what else would the deadlines refer to? It's a deadline. It has to do with time. Of course, you don't have to, we don't need you to specify that. What else would the deadlines be? Would they be deadlines around what color, shape, uh, uh, smell? Yes, it's around time. You don't need to specify that. We know that, Kamala. But she just adds more words into her answer, keeps padding out the answer with words and more words. Uh, and not even like colorful or interesting or descriptive words, just, just words so that she can talk without saying anything. And then to top it all off, she proceeds to admit, and again, she didn't need to. This was She wasn't backed into a corner. She didn't need to say this, but she proceeds to admit that the Inflation Reduction Act was actually a Trojan horse to push through her climate agenda. Um, talk about an unforced error. Now, anyone who's perceptive enough already knew that, but she didn't need to volunteer <laughs> that information. Uh, and yet she did, because she's just very bad at, at this. Um, then she was asked about flip-flopping again, this time around uh, the issue of fracking. Listen. And I made that clear on the debate stage in 2020, that I 
would not ban fracking. As vice president, I did not ban fracking. As president, I will not ban fracking. In 2019, I believe, uh, at a town hall, you said you were asked, would you commit to implementing a federal ban on fracking on your first day in office? And you said, there's no question I'm in favor of banning fracking. So yes. So it changed in, the, in that campaign? In 2020, I made very clear where I stand. We are in 2024, and I've not changed that position, nor will I going forward. I kept my word, and I will keep my word. What made you change that position at the time? Well, let's be clear. My values have not changed. I believe it is very important that we take seriously what we must do to guard against what is a clear crisis in terms of the climate. And to do that, we can do what we have accomplished thus far, the Inflation Reduction Act, what we have done to invest, by my calculation, over t probably a trillion dollars over the next 10 years, investing in a clean energy economy, what we've already done, creating over 300,000 new clean energy jobs. That tells me. So apparently her advisors gave her this, my values have not changed line. So they went into it. They knew they knew she was going to be asked about the flip flopping because she's changed her views on literally everything. Um, and uh, the only thing she's been consistent on is killing babies. That's the only issue that she's been consistent. She has been consistently in favor of that. So uh, you know, we'll, we'll, we'll give her that. She's been consistent on that issue. She's always cared deeply about killing babies. She wants to kill as many as she can. But um, everything else has changed. Every other single thing. And, and so they knew this going in, obviously, and her advisors gave her, uh, my values have not changed. She keeps repeating it. And that's the one thing. If you give Kamala a line and, she, and it plays well or she thinks it plays well, she will repeat it over and over and over again, even in the same conversation. And uh, it, even though it's not, it's not a good line, it's, I mean, it's not hard to come up with some good lines to kind of distract from the fact that you're a flip-flopping phony. That's not a good one. That's a bad one. And yet that's what they decided to have her do. And then she goes off on the climate again. And again, just quoting her, I believe it is very important that we take seriously what we must do to guard against what is a clear crisis in terms of the climate. What? Who speaks like that? that this is not human language. People don't talk like that. What you're trying to say, Kamala, is that we should take the climate crisis seriously. Now, never mind that there is no climate crisis, but... Uh, that's what you're trying to say. You're trying to say we should take the climate crisis seriously. So just say that. Just say those words. That's It's easy to say that. Why are you adding 14 extra words that are not needed? Um, and uh, and then there was a, also, the, we'll play one more from Kamala. She was asked uh, uh, about her failure on the border, and she tried to blame Trump for it. Let's hear that. As vice president, you were tasked with addressing the root causes of migration uh, in southern countries and northern that, part of Central America, the northern part of, of, yeah. of, uh, of Central America that deals with that affects the southern border of the U.S. Mm -hmm. During the Biden-Harris administration, there were record numbers of illegal border crossings. Why did the Biden-Harris administration wait three and a half years to implement sweeping asylum restrictions? Well, first of all, uh, the root causes work that I did as vice president that I was asked to do by the president has actually resulted in a number of benefits, including historic investments by American businesses in that region. Um, the number of uh, immigrants coming from that region has actually reduced um, since we began that work. But I will say this, that Joe Biden and I and our administration worked with members of the United States Congress on an immigration uh, issue that is very significant to the American people and to our security, which is the border. Mm -hmm. And through bipartisan work, including some of the most conservative members of the United States Congress, a bill was crafted, which we supported, which I support. And Donald Trump got word of this bill that would have contributed to securing our border. And because he believes that it would not have helped him politically, he told his folks in Congress, don't put it forward. He killed the bill. So Trump, who isn't even in office right now, is responsible for her own failures to secure the border. Uh, Trump killed the bill when he's not even an elected official. That's what she's going with. And it's just one of, of, of many really bad excuses, poor excuses, poorly communicated 
And if I had to sum up the interview, I'd sum it up that way. But no excuse offered during this interview was worse than this one from Tim Walls. So Tim mostly just sat there like a good puppy, quietly and obediently. Um, he did bark on command a few times when they offered him a, a treat. And uh, just just watch this moment when he's when he's when he is asked about the uh, about his stolen valor, about lying about his military record, and I mean it's it truly is an amazing answer. It's it's especially given that keep in mind he had to know that this question was going to be asked, and so you'd think he'd have something ready to go, and this is what he comes up with. I want to ask. Uh, you a question about how you've described your service in the National Guard. Mm. Uh, you said that you carried weapons in war, but you have never deployed actually in a war zone. A campaign official said that you misspoke. Did you? Well, first of all, I'm incredibly proud. I've done 24 years of wearing the uniform of this country. Equally proud of my service in a public school classroom, whether it's Congress or, uh, or the governor. Uh, my record speaks for itself, but I think uh, people are coming to get to know me. I, I speak like they do. Um, I speak candidly. I wear my emotions on my sleeves, and uh, I speak uh, especially passionately about uh, about our children being shot in schools and around around guns. So uh, I think people know me. They know who I am. They know where uh, where my heart is. And again, my record has been out there for over 40 years to, to speak for itself. And the the idea that you said that you were in war, yeah. did you misspeak as the campaign has said? Yeah, I said we were talking about, in this case, this was after a school shooting, the ideas of carrying these weapons of war. And uh, my wife, the English, she told me my grammar is not always correct. But again, if it's not this, it's an attack on my children for showing love for me or it's an attack on my dog. Okay, like it, it really is an incredible answer. I, I mean, for, for two incredible answers, because first he's asked, hey, why did you lie about your military record? And his first answer is, well, you know, I'm opposed to children being shot. Yeah, as are we all, Governor, but what the hell does that have to do with you lying about your military record? And then his second answer is that his grammar, he has poor grammar. Oh, shucks, you know, listen, I'm just a normal everyday guy. I wear blue jeans and sneakers. I mow my lawn, okay? I, I eat fast food. I go to Walmart. And, you know, sometimes we regular old everyday folk, we mix up our words and we use bad grammar. And sometimes our grammar is so bad that we accidentally lie about our military record for 20 years. Uh, I'll tell you what, Donald Trump, he's, a, he's such an elitist that he's never pretended to have combat experience. That's what an elitist he is. That's what we're going with, bad grammar. Don't you hate it when, when, when your grammar is so bad that it causes you, to, it causes you to invent whole periods of your life that never occurred? Yeah, I mean, one time I, you know, my grammar was so bad that I accidentally claimed that I was the deposed king of Cambodia. Uh, that's how bad my grammar was one time. It was just really, really bad grammar. Really bad. Silly me. Uh, so that's, that's what they're going with. It, it, there is one other thing I wanted to mention. Uh, so we've talked about the content of the of the the interview and such as it is, and that, that's it. I mean, that's that's what it was. And as I said, it kind of goes to show why uh, they really shouldn't have done. I, I mean, yes, they should do. Like from the from a perspective of just basic integrity, they should do interviews and talk to the American public because they they want to be in, in the White House. Um. But politically, strategically, they should not have done it. And I think this is maybe one of the smartest, best things that uh, the Trump camp has done during this election cycle, at least certainly since Kamala came on board, was to bait her into doing an interview. Um, it's really pressure. It, it, it's really entirely pressure from, that's what's so amazing about it. There was very little pressure from the left for her to do an interview. Because everybody on the left knows. They didn't, they didn't want her to do it because they knew it was going to go like this. Um, so it was all pressure from the right. You know, it was the Trump camp. It was just, it's like people like me, just, you know, nor just uh, conservative people with platforms. We're all the ones saying, hey, why is she out there doing interviews? She should really, <laughs> it's like, we obviously want you to do it because we know it's going to be terrible for you. That's why we want it. I mean, like this is, you know, and they, and they, and they succumbed to the pressure, and they put her out there, and it was terrible, um, which is great. So that's the content of it. But there's one other thing that I've just been—I—I—I I, I, 
it doesn't matter that much, but I'm um, maybe it's the media member in me. It's like, it's like the, the fact that I'm in media and I'm on camera uh, that makes me. Can we pull up the picture? Just pull up the screenshot of this of the interview so we can look at the. Okay. What is going on? What? What is this? What kind of set? Why are they? Why? Why are they doing? Why does it look like that? Is my question. That's what I want to know. What kind of set did they choose for this conversation? Because to me, it looks, I guess you can see it kind of says cafe in the background, but just first, first impressions when you look at it, to me, it looks like an empty airport bar at some kind of regional airport somewhere. The, they look like depressed travelers coming home from uh, a business conference at, a, at a, a Hilton somewhere in Cleveland. And it just, it's like a very weird, melancholy kind of vibe to it. And it's the lighting. It's, why is it so dark? Why is the lighting so dark? Why are there empty cups in the shot? Who That was deliberately put there. That's not naturally there. So they, for some reason, they chose this cafe. They made it very dark. Uh, they're going for that vibe. And they looked at the shot and somebody... I don't know if it's someone at CNN or someone in the, the Kamala campaign. Not that there's any distinction. Someone looked at the shot and said, you know what, wait a second. You know what we need? We need a bunch of empty cup, cups in the background. We need about, well, we're, we're no, no, more cups. No, not one or two. We need, we need 10 cups. Put 10 empty cups in the shot. We need all the empty cups we can get for this thing. Okay, we need the cups. There's the, not more cups. We need more cups. It doesn't make any sense. I don't get it. And they're all, why are they dressed in colors that match the furniture? He, he is dressed in the same color as the seat, so he blends in. Looks like he doesn't have a body, just like this big lumbering head floating, suspended in space. And then Kamala's dressed to match the table. So I, was that a, a plan? They said, we, we got to match the furniture. And she's also, look how short she, why is she so small compared to the other two? She looks like she's three feet tall. Like, get her a higher seat so that she doesn't look like a child. I mean, it's just bizarre. I don't, I don't get it. The whole, the whole thing is weird. I, I don't. That's, that's what I want to know. This, this, uh, forget about the content of it. I want to know why they set up the shot like that. Um, because it makes me sad. Actually, like it makes me sad that these people are running for president, but but just the 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 look of it, it, it kind of makes you sad. It has a sad kind of feel to it. All right, uh, this makes me sad. Also, Donald Trump yesterday was asked about Amendment Four in, in Florida, which is a ballot measure that would not only overturn Florida's abortion restrictions, but would in fact enshrine into law a right to abortion that goes all the way to birth. Um, it would enshrine a right to abortion through every stage of pregnancy. It is a pro-infanticide measure, radically far left, radically pro-abortion. And Trump, as a resident of Florida, was asked about it. And here's what he said. Florida, the state that you are a resident of, there's an abortion-related amendment on yeah. the ballot to overturn the six-week ban in mm -hmm. Florida. How are you going to vote on that? Well, I think the six week is too short. Uh, it has to be more time, and so that's, and I've told them that I want more weeks. So you'll vote in favor of the amendment? I'm, I'm voting that, I am going to be voting that we need more than six weeks. Look, just so you understand, everybody wanted Roe v. Wade terminated for years, 52 years. I got it done. They wanted it to go back to the states. Exceptions are very important for me, for Ronald Reagan, for others that have navigated this very, very interesting and difficult path. Okay, uh, it's being reported that in this clip, Trump said that he would vote for the amendment. He would vote for the right to abortion until birth. Um, he didn't say that, technically. He didn't say he'd vote for it. He also didn't say he'd vote against it. He kind of avoided it. And this has led to confusion and lots of anger from pro-life conservatives who, who pro-life conservatives who are just being kicked in the shins constantly at this point. And um, Trump needs to speak clearly on this. Okay, you need to be clear on this. It's, it's not a hard question. It's not difficult. His campaign came out after this clip went viral and clarified that Trump, Trump has not said how he would vote on the amendment. Okay, fine, he hasn't said yet. But he should say. Like, why hasn't he said? Why not just say, I'll vote against it? 
Again, this amendment would enshrine into law the constitutional right to kill babies until birth. It is the, one of the most radically pro-abortion uh, measures we've ever seen in this country, ever. How is it not easy to say, of course I'll vote against that? The, it is the right to kill fully developed, fully viable infant children seconds before they're born. This is radical leftism in its most extreme, bloodthirsty form, okay? And it's not hard to communicate that. Here's all that Trump has to say. And I can't do a Trump impression, so I, but in my own vo voice, here's what all Trump has. This is it. This is all he has to say. He can say this. I've said repeatedly that abortion should be left to the states. As a resident of Florida, uh, I will be voting no on this amendment because it guarantees a right to abortion until birth which is radically out of step with my own values and also radically out of step with the values of the vast majority of Americans. That's it. That's all you got to say. In and out. You're done. Okay? And, 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 and you must say that. You must say it because it's the right thing. You know, just as human beings, we have to be clear in our opposition to the murder of infants. And as a conservative and a leader and a man who wants to be president again, you have to demonstrate at least the moral clarity and wherewithal to specifically oppose a Soros-funded initiative to kill infants in the state you live in. Um, I mean, again, it, it's not hard and, and it's the right thing. But also politically, politically, uh, it is smart and necessary to oppose Amendment 4, especially now after giving this rather weak, convoluted confusing answer. It is politically essential because all that Trump is doing by dancing around it like this is demoralizing his pro-life base. And look, you can scream at pro-lifers all you want and demand that they still go out and vote. Uh, you know where I stand on that. I'm voting for Trump no matter what, because the alternative is Kamala Harris. Um, and I, I've been very clear about that. And we talked about it just a couple days ago. But there are political realities here, and one of them is that if you demoralize your base, that hurts you. You lose votes. So if Trump does not oppose Amendment 4 again, especially now after he gave that answer, if he does not, all he will be accomplishing is the demoralization of his base. That's it. It will not win him a single vote. The only people who would be happy about his refusal to denounce a Soros-funded baby murder amendment the only people pleased by that are radical leftists who would not vote for him if their lives depended on it, okay? Because the only people who support this amendment, you have to be a radical far left. The, how many people are there in the country who both would be willing to vote for Trump and support this amendment? Are there like five people in the entire country who would fit into that demographic? Um. The number of people that you, on your side, demoralize and alienate is so much bigger. It's such a, it's a, it's a much larger uh, base of people. The only people he's making happy are the people who would not piss on him if he was on fire, okay? Those are the people who are in favor of this amendment. If you were on fire, they would look at you and laugh, okay? Th those people. So again, just politically, why would you even hesitate to, to be against something that those people are doing? So uh, it's just a, it's just a uh, horrendously terrible political strategy. It just is. And, and you, 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 you're going to lose. You're going to lose the election with a strategy like that. It, it really would be no, it'd be this, it's this, it, it's as if Trump entertained the possibility of a constitutional amendment to protect the right to trans our kids, right? It's, it's, I mean, it's, it's that level of radical, radically far left. Um, and if he were to come out with that position, what, all you've done is just, you've, you've lost the election is all you've done. You have not, you're not going to gain a single vote. Again, the only people that care about that, you know, there are big trans rights people are people who never vote for you anyway. And so all you're doing is just, uh, destroying enthusiasm in your own base. Um, and it's it's a terrible, terrible strategy. Uh, I mean, uh, 
And so let's let's talk a little bit more about what Amendment 4 actually is, because there's a lot of inform- misinformation out there. And the pro-abortion left is lying about it, like they lie about everything. And here's what it says. I'll read it. This is the amendment. No law shall prohibit, penalize, delay, or restrict abortion before viability or when necessary to protect the patient's health as determined by the patient's health care provider. Now, because of the way it's worded, the left is claiming that actually it only allows abortion until, quote unquote, viability. That's what they're saying. And, but that, and that would be bad enough, by the way. I mean, you couldn't support that. No way, even if that's all, even if that was all it was doing. Um, because when is viability? Well, there's no clear answer. That's, that's the first problem. Uh, at a minimum, it makes abortion until 20 weeks, 21, 22 weeks into a basic human right now. And um, that would be more than enough reason to oppose it, especially if you, if you, you, know, if you claim to be pro-life and you say it's a state's rights issue, okay. Now, I, I don't think it is a states' rights issue. I think that it that it is a federal issue because this is a human this is about human rights and laws that legalize abortion are depriving human rights from an entire group of people who happen to be our children. And it's a human rights violation, therefore a constitutional issue. That's my position. But as I said, I don't expect Trump to take that position. I, I know that my position on that particular part of it is is unpopular. And if Trump took that position, he'd probably lose. So I'm aware of the politics of that. I don't expect that. Um, but if you go with states' rights, fine. But then you can't turn around and oppose a pro-life state law. It's it's you can't because you're not hiding behind. Well, it's a, it's not a federal issue. Yeah, it's, it's not. This is not federal. This is the state. We're in the state now. Um, so even that, even if it was just that, it was just vi- up till viability. Well, you, you couldn't support it. But it's way worse than that. It's way worse because note the text again. It says you can't restrict abortion before viability or or when necessary to protect the patient's health as determined by a healthcare provider. Or, note the or, notice the or. It is there for a reason. Or to protect the patient's health as determined by a healthcare provider. What does that mean? Well, it means that you can have an abortion until birth for any reason. That's what it means. Okay. Protecting the patient's health means anything. Whatever reason you have for wanting an abortion, that counts as protecting your health. There's a reason why they put health and not life. Have you noticed that? You notice how usually they, they say, well, you, the exception is uh, abortion to protect the life of the mother. Now, even that, uh, you, you never need to get an abortion to protect the life of the mother, uh, especially if it's a late-term abortion, there's no reason, you know, even if you have to terminate the pregnancy to, to save the, the mother's life, which sometimes you do, uh, you, you can terminate the pregnancy by delivering the child, which you have to deliver the child no matter what, one way or another. The question is whether you kill the child first before delivering him, and there's no reason why you would ever need to do that to protect the mother's life, but that's not even what it says. It doesn't say to protect the mother's life. It says health. What does health mean? Health means anything. Physical health, mental health, emotional health, financial health. Any kind of health. Okay, all you need to do is find some healthcare provider. Notice, not doctor. They're not even saying you need a doctor. They could have put doctor in there. They didn't say doctor. They said healthcare provider, which is not the same thing as doctor. You can get your damn podiatrist to sign off on it. I mean, really, that's that's the way it's written. Any healthcare provider. You just need some healthcare provider to give you a rubber stamp and say, uh, yeah, this is for your health. Which of course is what which is what will happen. And and uh, because health means anything. So you don't need to be Sherlock Holmes to put the pieces together. This is very clear. It's very obvious. Uh, the amendment is written that way with these loopholes, so that any woman can get an abortion at any time for any reason. Um, and if this thing passes, then Florida will become a mecca for abortion. It'll become, a, you know, you'll have abortion tourism. Abortion rates will skyrocket by like a thousand percent in the state. Um, with people coming in from out of state to get late term abortions, to kill babies at 35 weeks. That's what's going to happen. That's why they want this amendment. And 
it is, I can only reiterate for the umpteenth time, it is so easy to say, I'm against that. I don't, that's bad. Anyone who's remotely winnable for a Republican would agree with you on that. If they would not agree that killing babies at 35 weeks is wrong and you shouldn't do it, if they don't agree with you on that, you can't win them anyway. Those are the people that are totally unwinnable no matter what you do. You could fall at their feet and beg them to vote. You can say, I'll give you everything you want if you vote for me. They will spit on you and still vote for Kamala Harris. Those are not winnable voters. Um, so, look, I don't want any, anyone who actually wants Trump to win. You don't have to give me a speech about how it's, how it's important that Trump wins. You don't have to give me that. I give that speech all the time. But if you actually think that, well, this is political suicide and you need to be speaking out about it. And if you're not, then you actually don't, you apparently don't care if he wins. Well, you didn't vote for this recession, but uh, you sure as heck pay for it at the, at the pump, at the grocery store. And with that growing stack of unpaid bills, if you're one of millions of Americans being crushed with financial stress right now, the solution is donewithdebt.com. Unlike some of the other guys, Done With Debt has created new aggressive strategies designed to get you out of debt permanently without bankruptcy or loans. Done With Debt stands between you and the bill collectors. They negotiate with your creditors to write off balances, cut interest, and stop penalties. They have a plan to put more money in our pocket uh, in, on month one and every month until your debt is done. Best news is that Done With Debt is accepting new clients right now, but you need to hurry because some of their debt strategies are time sensitive and you don't want to miss out. But Done With Debt, hit the debt reset button for you and make your money yours again. But again, this is time sensitive. So you need to visit donewithdebt.com or call 1-888-322-1054 right now. Chat with one of their debt relief strategists for free. Go to donewithdebt.com. That's donewithdebt.com. Our Labor Day sale is uh, here right now. Get 40% off new annual, annual Daily Wire Plus memberships at dailywire.com slash subscribe. Use code LABOR40 at checkout with the most important election of our lifetime looning. You need facts, not leftist propaganda. Here's what you get with Daily Wire Plus. Uncensored, ad-free daily shows from the most trusted names in media. Our full catalog of culture-shaping documentaries and series on demand. Live breaking news and hard-hitting investigative journalism. Plus, comprehensive election coverage. We're tracking every race, exposing every liberal lie, and giving you the unfiltered facts to make informed decisions. This Labor Day, join us as we fight the left and build a future. Go to dailywire.com slash subscribe now. Use code LABOR40 for 40% off new Daily Wire Plus annual memberships. Now let's get to our daily cancellation. On Monday, a U.S. Army veteran named Lucas O'Hara was at Arlington Cemetery for a private ceremony marking the 30th anniversary of the 2021 Kabul uh, airport attack, which uh, resulted in the deaths, uh, you may remember, of 13 members of the U.S. military. Donald Trump was at Arlington Cemetery, too, because he had been invited by the families of the fallen soldiers. Now, at one point, Trump was photographed and videotaped walking alongside Arlington's deputy chief of staff while he was laying a wreath at the tomb of the unknown soldier. Now, the deputy chief of staff didn't seem to think anything was amiss. Neither did O'Hara, um, who later described the ceremony this way, quote, I've witnessed over 75 wreath-laying ceremonies performed by politicians and conducted 524 funerals in this cemetery during the time I served in the presidential honor guard for three years. What I got to witness yesterday was the most respectful and solemn ceremony I have seen. There were no speeches, no angles, no weird photo ops, just our elected officials and the 45th president respectfully and solemnly honoring the fallen and their families. Now, as you might have heard, the corporate press has a very different spin on what happened, and it's not hard to see why they're so upset. Any ceremony marking the deaths of the service members at Abbey Gate is inevitably also a reminder of the Biden administration's disastrous handling of the withdrawal from Afghanistan. What happened at Abbey Gate was obviously preventable, and Democrats don't want to acknowledge that, especially in an election year. So instead, they're attempting to turn this ceremony into yet another desperate attempt to smear Donald Trump. MSNBC accused Trump of staging a bizarre and disrespectful photo op, for example. The Daily Beast and many other outlets did the same. Uh, NPR suggested that Trump's campaign had no right to photograph the ceremony at all. And NBC, in a, an especially unhinged moment, even went after the mother of one of the fallen soldiers who invited Trump. Watch. Former president to Arlington. Her son, Marine Staff Sergeant Taylor Hoover, died at Abbey Gate. 
What would you say to people who may be pro-Trump, anti-Trump, whatever their politics might be, who just feel like that's not a place for politicians or for politics? Um, I would have to say, if, are you in my shoes? Um, I invited him. Um, my son was, was murdered under the Biden-Harris administration. Well, that guy is a total scumbag um, and certainly not the only one working in media. Anytime a journalist says, what would you say to people who might say, you know they're about to hit you with some kind of smear. They're just too cowardly to ask the question directly, so they attribute it to unnamed people instead. They know at some level it's completely repulsive to ask a question this idiotic to the mother of a fallen soldier, but they have to find a way to ask it anyway. And in this case, this, the smear isn't just idiotic. It's about as hypocritical and one-sided as it could possibly be. I mean, there are about a million examples of Democrats using photographs from Arlington Cemetery in literal campaign advertisements. And precisely none of those incidents caused any kind of media outcry whatsoever. So here's Joe Biden from just four years ago. Watch. This year, Memorial Day feels a little different. This pandemic is showing us that service and bravery and willingness to stand on the front lines to help and protect our fellow human beings is not just the quality we find in our service members. It's at the core of every American spirit. This Memorial Day offers each of us a chance to reflect on the enormity of their sacrifice. For those of you who are missing the peace of your hearts this Memorial Day, your sacrifice will never quite end. That doesn't mean we shouldn't do our best to ease the weight so you don't have to carry their legacies alone. And all of us who have lost loved ones, days like this can be bittersweet. So as to all the members of our military and our military families, especially those who've lost their service member, thank you, we owe you. We can never lessen the magnitude of your loss. This I can promise you, we will never forget. May God bless you all. May God protect our troops. Okay, so in case, in case you couldn't see the whole thing, the ad showed Joe Biden at Arlington Section 60, which is largely reserved for fallen soldiers from the wars in Iraq and Afghanistan. And the photo was followed by the message, Biden for president, and a phone number to text if you want to join the campaign. So what happened to that's not a place for politicians or for politics? Why didn't NBC or any corporate media outlet have that question when that advertisement aired four years ago? There's no chance they missed it because these kinds of ads have been constant. They've been used in both of, Bi in both of Biden's presidential campaigns. Here's another one from just this summer. He's a war hero because he was captured. I like people that weren't captured. I'm not going to play the whole thing, but it ends with a Biden-Harris campaign logo. They're using caskets of fallen soldiers and grave sites, once again, in a campaign ad. And for good measure, the ad accuses Trump of calling fallen soldiers suckers, which is a claim that's based entirely on unnamed sources that spoke to the left-wing Atlantic magazine. Again, there was no outrage when this ad ran just a, a few weeks ago. Nobody noticed or said anything about it. And there are many more examples like this. There are plenty of photographs of U.S. presidents at Arlington, including Barack Obama. You can see some of the photos there. Uh, really standard stuff. You know, none of this is a scandal. And it's obviously appropriate for political figures to pay their respects at Arlington Cemetery. And it's not unusual for there to be photographs of that. It's especially appropriate when the families of fallen soldiers have invited those political figures in the first place. Everybody understood that until 15 seconds ago, when Donald Trump made the mistake of reminding people that the Biden administration completely botched the withdrawal from Afghanistan. There's another aspect to this manufactured scandal, which is that someone on Trump's staff supposedly made physical contact with a staffer at the cemetery. Apparently, one of the staffers um, objected to what Trump and the family members of the fallen soldiers were doing. Quoting from an Army statement, quote, participants in the August 26th ceremony and the subsequent Section 60 visit were made aware of federal laws, Army regulations, and DOD policies, which clearly prohibit political activities on cemetery grounds. An ANC employee who attempted to ensure adherence to these rules was abruptly pushed aside. This incident was unfortunate, but also unfortunate that the ANC employee and her professionalism has been unfairly attacked. ANC is a national shrine to the honored dead of the armed forces, and its dedicated staff will continue to ensure public ceremonies are conducted with the dignity and respect the nation's fallen deserve. Now, the Army went 
on to note that the incident had been reported to the police, which obviously comes off as an extremely disproportionate, hysterical reaction to a minor conflict like this. But they added that no charges are going to be filed, probably because the whole idea of reporting this incident to the police is laughable on its face. The Pentagon then came out and said they supported the Army's statement. Now, obviously, I wasn't at Arlington Cemetery on Monday, so I have no idea what happened or didn't happen between a Trump staffer and a staffer at the cemetery. Um, nor do I especially care. What I can say is that the tone of the statement is remarkable. The Army appears to be extremely outraged that the, quote, professionalism of somebody working at the cemetery was, quote, unfairly attacked. They won't stand for that, even though it appears from the vast amounts of precedent we have that the staffer was completely wrong to begin with. But the really interesting thing is that the Pentagon never demonstrated anywhere near this much consternation when their incompetence allowed a suicide bomber to kill the 13 members of the U.S. military that Donald Trump was honoring on Monday. I don't recall the Pentagon approving statements condemning their own handling of the Afghanistan withdrawal. In fact, I recall the opposite. I recall the military decided to retaliate by accidentally blowing up the car of a random Afghan aid worker. And then they lied and said that there were no civilian casualties when, in fact, they killed nine members of his family. And even then, nobody in the Pentagon was publicly dressed down for that. The, the Army reserves, uh, I guess, those kinds of snarky, hostile statements for the Trump campaign and only the Trump campaign. This kind of response only makes sense when you realize that the Democrat Party and the leadership of the Pentagon want us to forget what happened in Afghanistan three years ago. They're so desperate that they're willing to badger the family members of those fallen service members and call the police on the Trump campaign. I mean, they'd rather we talk about all of this manufactured drama instead of the 13 service members who died and how they died. And that is why NBC News and every other outlet that's debasing itself to smear Donald Trump for participating in that memorial at Arlington Cemetery are all today canceled. That'll do it for the show today and this week. Talk to you on Monday. Have a great weekend. Godspeed. Republicans are Nazis. You cannot separate yourselves from the bad white people. Growing up, I never thought much about race. It never really seemed to matter that much, at least not to me. Am I racist? I would really appreciate it if you left. I'm trying to learn. I'm on this journey. If I'm going to sort this out. I need to go deeper undercover. They don't say I'm racist. Joining us now is Matt, certified DEI expert. Here's my certification. And what you're doing is you're stretching out of your whiteness. Listen more for you in this field. Is America inherently racist? The word inherent is challenging there. I want to rename the George Washington Monument to the George Floyd Monument. America is racist to its bones. The so inherently. Yeah, this country is a piece of... White folks, white trash, white supremacy, white woman, white boy. Is there a black person around here? What's a black person right here? Does he not exist? Say I'm racist. Hi, Robin. Hi. What's your name? I'm Matt. I just had to ask who you are because you have to be careful. <laughs> Never be too careful. They gonna say you racist. Buy your tickets now in theaters September 13th. Rated PG-13.